This is a photo that I took from the ledge of my university, and you can see the National Guard lined up there prohibiting us from protesting. And I remember we had our hands in the air painted white as a sign of peace, and they just tear gassed us and opened up the water cannons. I was actually there with my brother and sister, and I remember that as the protest started, I was holding on to my younger brother and my younger sister, and by the time it ended, I didn't know where my siblings were. So I've covered protests in places as different and distant as Hong Kong, Haiti, Mexico City, Ferguson, Missouri, probably more than anything else. And it is because I see myself in all of those people who are out there risking their lives, risking their jobs, out there with their children because they see no other way than to take to the streets. This year, we saw the world erupt in protests, and one of the major ones was the Hong Kong protests of 2019, which really started 2014 when I went there uh, to cover the Umbrella Revolution. We saw that same movement take the streets of Hong Kong again this year. For over six months, Hong Kong has been consumed by pro-democracy protests, a movement that's primarily been led by students. On June 16th, organizers say nearly two million people took to the streets in defiance of the Chinese government and a controversial extradition bill. Since then, the protests have become increasingly more violent. In November, citywide demonstrations erupted after police began raiding college campuses to make arrests. Pro-democracy candidates did win big in November's local elections. Still, the protests are set to continue into the new year. In Iran, it was an increase in gasoline prices that triggered several days of civil unrest in November. It was like nothing the country had seen since the Iranian revolution 40 years ago. In total, at least 300 people are believed to have been killed according to Amnesty International, with thousands more wounded or detained. In Iraq, it was a movement primarily led by young and lower income people calling for an end to corruption poor infrastructure, unemployment, among other issues. At least 354 people have been killed since protests began at the start of October, according to the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights. The prime minister resigned from his post amid pressure from the protests. Not far in Lebanon, their prime minister was also forced to resign after a proposed fee on internet voice calls that triggered countrywide protests calling for the end of government corruption. Several hundred thousand people took to the streets in what have mostly been peaceful protests. Meanwhile, the symbolic Cacerolazo protests, which involves the banging of pots and pans in South America, where I'm from, could be heard in the streets of several countries. The most surprising being Chile, a country with a reputation as one of the most stable democracies in the region. It was actually a four cent subway hike back in October that unleashed protesters' fury over wealth inequality and failings within the public service sector. These protests have been extremely violent. At least 20 deaths and thousands injured, according to Chile's National Institute of Human Rights. The Chilean government was forced to cancel two major international summits, including APEC in November. In Colombia, the sounds of pots and pans could also be heard echoing through the nation. Since mid-November, Hundreds of thousands of protesters have been taken to the streets. What originated as a planned labor union strike has since transformed into widespread actions against the government and their use of unconventional weapons toward protesters, many now calling for the resignation of President Duque. In Bolivia, 
It took several weeks of upheaval before President Evo Morales fled to Mexico. Claims of election fraud surfaced after his October election win, in which he disregarded term limits. Clashes among rival protesters were intensified by security forces whose actions were deemed unnecessary and disproportionate by the UN. The widespread tensions have left more than 600 people detained and at least 17 dead. And finally, my home country of Venezuela. Since mid-January, the nation has been consumed by protests over the reign of Nicolás Maduro. The demonstrations began after Maduro's second inauguration and led by opposition leader Juan Guaidó. The conflict, as well as the humanitarian crisis, has caught the attention of the international community, most notably the United States. Both President Trump and Vice President Pence have taken a hard stance against Maduro. Now, a breakthrough appeared to be within reach in February when the opposition attempted to bring in aid by truck over international bridges. But the tense standoff would subside and Maduro would remain in power, which he still does to this day. But the year of the protests has not only been felt in Hong Kong, the Middle East and South America. In Spain, the movement to make the region of Catalonia its own state spurred a protest of half a million people after the sentencing of separatist leaders. In Russia, there were protests against the government and economy. In Haiti, protesters called for the resignation of President Juvenel Moise. In Pakistan, anti-government protesters are fighting against the deteriorating economy as well as civil rights actions. And next door in India, protests broke out in opposition to a new citizenship law that people fear will impact the large Muslim community there. In France, the so-called yellow jackets took to the streets to protest a gas tax and have continued to call out social inequality. When I was protesting in college, there was no social media, no smartphones, no streaming. So we had this huge power, but protests weren't as powerful as they are today. I believe today, and you see it with the kids fighting for gun reform. You saw it in countries like Bolivia, where the president resigned over these protests. Protests have the power to get the rest of the world's attention on an issue, on a country, on the plight of a people. And if they are massive enough, they can overthrow governments, as we saw. I think they are powerful in that they showcase discontent and they ultimately reflect that all of us as human beings, no matter where we live, whether it be the Middle East or South America or Europe, all of us want the same things, which is peace and a better tomorrow for our families. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.